Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet, risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind bucklers. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp for you.com mtp for you.com to start your 30 day free trial. I'm very happy today to have David Orban here with me today. And David is a thinker, investor, futurist, and uh, an outspoken technophile. And he has been a mentor of the Thiel Fellowship for many years, and he's also an early investor in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ether. Welcome to the Judgment Call podcast. How are you, David? Thank you, and uh, I'm just great. Uh, it has been a long day, but uh, I like to relax with a wonderful conversation at the end of the day. So I'm happy uh, to be on your show. I hope I can deliver this. Um, I'm going to do my best. Um, you just told me you're in Italy um, since the start of the pandemic. Um, how did that um, feel to you? Did, we saw a lot of scary images early on with Italy, and, and there seemed to be a lot of talk about lockdowns. How did it feel on the ground? Um, my daughter um, uh, uh, was 19 last year, uh, actually uh, on, on 2019, when she moved to Seoul. Um, and um, most of my activities are in New York, right? So um, I have a home in Italy. And think about the sequence. The origin of the pandemic was China, Wuhan. Then the first epicenter outside of China was Seoul, where my daughter was. Then it moved to Bergamo, Italy, where uh, I have my home. And then on to, to New York. So my pattern matching was really in um, uh, kind of supercharged, almost bordering into superstition territory. Uh, and I was, you know, quotation marks happy uh, when uh, Brazil became the epicenter, I don't know, whenever it was in April or May, uh, because I have nothing to do with Brazil. Uh, until then, it really felt uh, the, the the pandemic was kind of following me. And uh, the way I, I, I describe it is that it was like a, an angst-ridden, boring zombie movie. Um, uh, Bergamo was very, very heavily hit. Um, uh, and when the lockdown came, uh, you could hear nothing. I have a nice terrace. It was March. The birds started singing, and the and uh, the uh, the trees or the flowers were were blossoming. And uh, I would be sitting on my terrace, sipping my espresso after lunch, and it would be eerie, total silence, except 
for the sirens of the ambulances and the church's bells tolling for the dead until they stopped because the ambulances realized they didn't need to sound the siren. There was no one else on the, on the streets except them. And the churches uh, stopped celebrating uh, uh, the funerals because they couldn't take any more of the dead. And, and the image that became really uh, symbolic, almost kind of a science fiction image uh, of the um, um, 70 plus trucks picking up the dead in the nighttime to bring them elsewhere because the crematories were full. Uh, it really, really um, created a... Um, kind of a PTSD uh, reaction in, in, in so many people. So um, I, I uh, didn't uh, have any uh, of my close family or, or, or uh, you know, myself uh, uh, ill, but I did have uh, friends ill and, and, uh, and acquaintances dying. And, and um, uh, you know, <laughs> it is not over. We are crossing our fingers with the vaccine uh, being now, uh, as we are recording this, um, uh, being, uh, uh, you know, distributed, uh, which is a fantastic scientific achievement. And now it is going to be one of the largest uh, logistics endeavors uh, of the planet, if not the largest. Uh, and, uh, and so the race is on for the protection to kick in before the mutation uh, creates a strain that is not, um, you know, covered by the current version of the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, I, I, given the, the sequence of events, I hope you're not concerned that you're one of the super spreaders. <laughs> it might have followed you or you might have taken it. Uh, it still does a lot. Well, there's a lot of I, 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 how, I, how this all, how this all happened. Right? I'm just I'm just joking. I'm not I'm not taking this seriously. Do it is a very serious topic, unfortunately. But do, we we don't know a lot about the spread, right? We know that there have been cases in November, December or last year in 2019, um, or not last year, the year before, um, of a lot of pneumonia-related deaths in Italy. Um, actually, all over Europe. Actually, my my grandmother. Yeah. She died from uh, just virus pneumonia in January 2020. Just it was diagnosed with COVID, right? So we don't know what actually happened at one point. It seems to be this spread was quite early from China to the Chinese community in Italy um, that then might have spread it inside Europe. And uh, But that wasn't really clear in March, right? Everyone was just, okay, it's here now, and we, we have to panic, and understandably, everyone panicked. And so um, just a, a few days ago, um, uh, an Italian scientist, a dermatologist, uh, went back uh, and looked at the uh, results of biopsies done uh, in November, uh, because one of the not 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 most frequent, but one of the uh, side effects of uh, COVID is uh, some um, you know uh, skin um, uh, skin uh, eruptions. And, uh, and, and he was able to identify uh, the virus um, traces in those biopsies. So, yes, uh, in, in, in November, the virus was already uh, in Italy. Um, it is going to be for years, if not decades, uh, an incredible source of uh, new knowledge and learning uh, from the point of view of uh, epidemiology, of course, uh, but also from the point of view of epistemology, memetics, um, social sciences, anthropology, uh, to understand uh, what uh, uh, we could have done differently um, because um, it is the first uh, pandemic of the 21st century, but certainly not the last. Yeah. Well, you, I introduced you as a futurist. That's what, what I could gather from what I already know about you. And I hope that's correct. Well, one thing I really, really wondered about always is what, what is actually a futurist? What stands behind that? And, and what does a futurist do all day? So, 
it is a, a, a label, you know, and um, I accept it when you, <laughs> so I'm not going to contest uh, you um, uh, giving me the label. Um, but actually, I, I do believe that just as we are all scientists, you know, when you are born and you learn uh, how to walk and how to speak, the approach that you take is absolutely scientific. You do experiments, you observe the results and incorporate them in future experiments. And, uh, and after growing up, uh, it is really um, kind of abnormal for some people to stop being a scientist, having been born one. So similarly, I believe we are all not only futurists, we are all time travelers and uh, we are, you know, traveling at uh, uh, a minute per minute speed in time towards the future that we are going to inhabit together. And um, under this kind of perspective, a futurist is someone who applies him or herself to maximize the probability that when we get there together, in the place we call the future, they are going to like it. And uh, the aspiration, but also uh, at an ever increasing rate, the ability to fulfill this uh, desire is uh, exhilarating because we have that power. Uh, it is one of the distinguishing factors we have uh, across the spectrum of sentient be beings that that we do concern ourselves with different kinds of futures. And we compare the outcomes and we, when we are smart and we are able to convince others to work together um, to maximize desirable outcomes, desirable futures and minimize the probability of catastrophic ones. Yeah, I, I, I always, thought that uh, there was something that Jordan Peterson raised at some point, and he said, given, given all the own predictions that we make about the future, our immediate future or the future of the world, and all the things that could go wrong, um, kind of what we see on news every day, we see the things that went wrong for whatever reason. We don't see the millions of things that actually went right every day, maybe because they're boring. But our mind is really focused on extrapolating these things that are unusual and that potentially cause um, a danger for us in the future. But given that we know all this and given that we are, as you say, rightly concerned about the future and we are trying to constantly make predictions about our everyday life but also into things that are further out, how can we still fight this anxiety, right? We, we kind of have that the problem that given that we have so many scenarios that could turn out badly in the future, we should all have this crazy anxiety and should never get out of bed because it seems like wherever this goes, 99% of the outcomes are potentially harmful to us. Have you thought about that? Um, listen, you have less than two minutes to live until your next breath. So it's fine. Um, uh, my attitude is that of an optimist uh, taking roots in a kind of a, a nihilism. You know, at the end, we are going to die. And, you know, I am also someone who is um, absolutely on, in favor of radical longevity, right? So when I say at the end we are going to die, I don't mean when I'm 80 years old, maybe I mean when I'm 80 million years old or 8 billion years old, right? But at the end, um, either um, we go under the bus, whatever form of a bus uh, uh, there will be in uh, uh, 80 million years, uh, uh, or we are so profoundly changed that looking back, we will recognize that the self that you felt was you back then ceased to exist. So with that kind of point of view, uh, the, the idea really is to relatively relax, not too much, 
but to relatively relax and to enjoy the ride and to make sure that others uh, can enjoy the ride as well. One of the reasons why it is hard to relax completely is what is called the Fermi paradox, that even though it would look like with so many stars, so many galaxies, uh, so many ways that life could uh, uh, evolve to uh, generate an intelligent technological civilization, we haven't seen any except uh, on Earth. And as long as the responsibility of waking up uh, the universe uh, uh, falls on our shoulders, it really is uh, not uh, the, the right thing to, to be too cavalier about what we do. We just cannot afford to end the experiment that has been running for 13 billion years. Yeah, talking about, ex talking about experiments, and um, I know you, you, you work with Peter Thiel, and I'm curious about your ex personal experience as well as your professional experience. I really, really think he's, he's a great, um, very optimistic um, and very contrary and intellectual, so to speak. He really develops opinions, and he's not anymore. He's not shy to, to put them out there. One of his ideas um, or findings is this big stagnation that we... Uh, we haven't seen the same growth in major technology, technological breakthroughs in the last 50 years. Um, the, we had this big period of growth in pretty much all avenues between the 50s and the 70s. And then it kind of tapered off. There's still in, uh, incredible growth in semiconductors and anything that's related to it as well as finance. But the rest of the world kind of looks more or less like in the 70s. Do you agree with this? Um, and and kind of what's your, your relationship with Peter Thiel? Uh, so, um, as, as you said at the beginning, I'm a mentor at the TL Fellowship, uh, but Peter is uh, pretty hands-off, uh, as well as I am not uh, part of the staff of the Fellowship itself. So, it wouldn't be correct to say that I uh, work or did work with, uh, with Peter. Um, I have had the chance of interacting with him uh, in person several times. And, of course, I am familiar with his... Uh, um, investment uh, thesis and uh, his um, absolute uh, uh, attachment to uh, being a, a contrarian, which is, of course, uh, an almost necessary compo uh, component of, of being a, a, a value-added uh, investor. You know, you cannot follow uh, the crowd. You, ha you have to uh, be a trailblazer. You have to um, prove that your thinking, even though no one else uh, believes what you're saying, is right and everyone else is, is, is wrong. And now, of course, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, there is a guarantee that you will be right. And uh, Peter's um, results are not a uh, 100% uh, success rate either. Um, in particular, I do disagree uh, with the fact that uh, uh, we are in this uh, stagnation uh, period. I think that uh, it is a somewhat provincial outlook, uh, both in terms of uh, geography, uh, because if you look at uh, China uh, in the past uh, 20, 30 years, and you were, I don't know, living in Shanghai, and Peter Thiel came and said, oh, in the past 30 years, nothing changed you would tell him that he's crazy because everything changed in the past uh, third years uh, in Shanghai or Shenzhen and in many other places uh, in, in the world. And, and it is also not true from uh, the point of view of uh, uh, many uh, different kinds of technologies. Um, artificial intelligence, for example, uh, has had a, a kind of a stagnation, if you wish, uh, in the past, uh, uh, in the last two decades of the 20th uh, century. And then with enough hardware um, performance, enough data uh, being uh, accumulated and smarter algorithms that could run efficiently on the new hardware crunching the data, 
we have seen an absolute revolution in artificial intelligence fulfilling dreams that people in the field had uh, nurtured for 50 or 70 years without even knowing if uh, it would be ever achievable. Um, things that uh, those who don't know shrug about, like uh, Google's DeepMind AlphaGo beating the world champion uh, of the game of Go, Lee Sedol, uh, in 2016, well, that result came 20, 30 years earlier than the experts would have predicted. And uh, OpenAI um, published uh, a report uh, together with Stanford University where they are observing that uh, in the eight years from 2012 to 2020, uh, the uh, power of AI, rather than doubling at the uh, you know, sedate rate of every two years uh, with Moore's law that we have been accustomed to observe with our smartphones and personal computers, it has been doubling every four months. And as a consequence, rather than improving 30-fold or so, it increased its power 300,000 times over the course of those eight years. And just a few months ago, the CEO of NVIDIA um, in uh, their uh, uh, global conference uh, declared that they are now observing the power of AI doubling every two months. So from two years doubling rate to four months doubling rate to two months doubling rate, that is what I call a jolting technology, where the jolt is the measure of the increasing rate of acceleration. So I would say this is a very concrete and precise example to say that, no, Peter, uh, things are not stagnating. Yeah, I really like your insight into this. It's a really good example. For fairness sake, though, Peter makes that, that exception on saying anything that's related to semiconductors, which AI in a certain sense is because it runs on semiconductors, but I, I agree it's, it's been developing out of that, that Moore's law. Um, we had Steve Schwartz on the show a couple of episodes ago. He um, has been a professor for statistics and um, artificial intelligence since the 80s, and he was very pessimistic and in that sense that he said there's a lot of advance, but basically you're still looking at advances in terms of statistics. So you, you are faster and better with statistics, but there is actually no intelligence. And uh, on the other hand, um, I was listening to, to a podcast with uh, one of the uh, co-founders and uh, co-project heads of GPT-3, um, part of OpenAI, and he made that claim, and I thought that's fascinating. He said um, there's a good chance, maybe 30, 40, 50 percent, it's hard to pin it down on what actually um, the, uh, the success rate is, but he said the next generation after GPT-4, so was something we can see in a couple of months or maybe in a couple of years, he said that will resemble artificial general intelligence because they're not just using any knowledge that's ever um, been put into some kind of digital form. We'll also know all the feedback from things where it got wrong in GPT-3, all the, the, the training that humans do with certain input where it tells the AI, no, this is actually incorrect. So he wasn't saying it's 100% in, in artificial intelligence. Um, in a general way, he said there's a very good chance that it feels like to the observers, it's almost indistinguishable from a gen artificial general intelligence. Are you as optimistic or you feel like um, you, you're more somewhere in the middle there? So, uh, obviously, um, the people who are saying that uh, artificial general intelligence is not possible uh, behave uh, um, with, with statements that are offensive to you and me um, I don't know about you, but I um, am happy to be a representative, hopefully, of an artificial general intelligence, right? So AGI is possible in principle. Now, what does constitute AGI components? Uh, is mere statistics enough? We don't know. 
it, it may very well be. Uh, we do not have a coherent theory uh, of uh, human intelligence and how the brain works. Um, Roger Penrose uh, received uh, the Nobel Prize for Physics, luckily not for his more um, heterodoxical theories about how quantum phenomena generate consciousness in the human brain via nano tubules and the fact that those uh, uh, maintain uh, quantum coherence and without that uh, human consciousness wouldn't be possible. It sounds uh, really spacey. Oh, it sounds like he, he, he had some drugs when he wrote these papers. Well, why not? Uh, I'm not yeah. against it at all, but uh, it works. But, but uh, it is kind of a metaphysical, magical thinking. Yeah. It is not explanatory. Uh, it just pushes the problem further out. And, and too many people, unfortunately, uh, like Deepak Chopra, for example, take advantage uh, of the quotation marks mystery of quantum phenomena to further confuse things rather than uh, clarify them. And then when, for example, Deepak Chopra, when he meets with someone who doesn't uh, let him go off easily uh, admits, like uh, in an interview with Richard uh, Dawkins, that he actually talks about uh, consciousness being quantum uh, in a metaphorical manner. Well, it would be so much better if he didn't use those metaphors because they clarify nothing, just like Penrose's theories clarify very, very little. So going back, uh, one of the uh, big surprises of GPT-3 has been the fact that the performance of the network didn't start to taper off. You know, we love to talk about exponential curves, and in the physical world, uh, um, each uh, single exponential uh, turns into an S-curve, a logistic curve, uh, when it exhausts its power. That is why we are not using uh, vacuum tubes uh, for computers anymore, because they are so unreliable that it would take us more than 24 hours to find and substitute the ones that don't work before being able to boot up our computers. But actually, when Ray Kurzweil or other people like him talk about the exponential um, component of technological acceleration, and I talk about super exponentials with uh, jolting technologies, we don't talk about a single technology, but uh, the ability of uh, generation after generation of uh, separate uh, technologies to uh, design uh, seamlessly the um, further acceleration that we are seeing. So GPT-3 did not start going into the S-curve, uh, petering out of uh, uh, the lack of increasing performance, it did uh, increase its performance. And that is why specialists uh, are looking at potentials GPT-4, GPT-5, and ask themselves, what is going to happen if those models are going to increase their performance further to the point that uh, uh, we, we would expect the kinds of behaviors that we would label intelligent, right? If, if you ask uh, GPT-3 or the latest wonderful picture generating um, uh, model that, uh, that OpenAI uh, published a few uh, days ago, uh, DAL-E, in, to explain uh, what moved the model to write what it writes or to paint what it paints, they wouldn't be able to do so. They don't have the kind of reflective uh, self-explanatory power, what uh, in a human we would call self-awareness. But there is economic pressure in order to develop those kinds of explanations. In the European Union, 
there is a billion euro available in grants to create explainable AI systems. That's a nice chunk of money. And so you can be sure that whether it takes two years or four years, it doesn't matter, but pretty soon we will have AI systems that when uh, you ask them, okay, so you drew an avocado armchair because I asked you, but why exactly did you write it that way? And, and they should be able to explain that. And that will be fascinating, um, a little bit I, like... I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, this is going to happen. And I think uh, what, what people are confusing is what men, uh, because of the definition of artificial general intelligence is kind of open. What I think is definitely going to happen relatively quickly that we have um, a set of a trained AI that just does pretty much what anyone with a common sense would do. So it is smarter than pretty much any human on the planet. And that includes a lot of Nobel Prize winners. What, what we don't know is why it does things. It will have trouble. This is my prediction. This could be completely different once it happens. I feel it, it doesn't have this, this, it cannot tell an odd from it. It's kind of the same problem we have. This kind of, or maybe, maybe this is just another AI problem. It, it cannot really have this, this moving itself, understanding of itself and moving forward into the future and what it should do. I think it will struggle with this. But it will, and it will be a, for a long-term issue. But I think it will to anyone who interacts with it, and they don't know its machine. Um, obviously, they will know pretty quickly. They will realize this is kind of the smartest human being that knows the most, and it has an understanding of things, but it cannot really explain itself. This would be my prediction, but that's just a gut feeling. Um, when the, the the instances when I interacted with GPT three, that's kind of how it felt to me. It has this amazing body of knowledge, and it is almost almost right, um, depending on how you feed it. But people will say, well, this is just statistics, it's just a translation algorithm, and they're right. But at some point, you don't know, you don't know why some scientists have extremely high IQ, why Nietzsche has an IQ maybe of 200 or young, and they couldn't explain it, right? They, they, they didn't know why they were born with these things and how they made use of it, it just came to them. Well, and, and we have to aim uh, further and farther. Um, just because we have been struggling uh, and and we are admiring the extremely error-prone approach of uh, a monk retreating uh, to a hilltop for 30 years to achieve the deep insights uh, of uh, enlightenment. And, and we wish more of us could uh, achieve that state and, and we know we, we, we can't. That doesn't mean that the method is optimal. So uh, we shouldn't aim to achieve human level AGI, and we won't. You know, it will it will be uh, like a, like a race car uh, at uh, two hundred miles an hour uh, crossing the uh, uh, the checkered flag, and then not stopping. The race car is not gonna stop. It's just gonna keep going. And uh, the human level AGI will have happened for, you know, a fraction of a minute or a fraction of an hour. Uh, and, uh, and then the performance of the system will be as uh, superior to human performance in every aspect as the performance of the goal-playing uh, computer has been superior uh, to every other Go player. Now, that is also true in their explanatory abilities. What will not change is our ability to understand. So the an increasing amount of effort by the AGIs will be spent, if they are gracious enough, to find ever more powerful and novel ways to dumb down their explanations so that we can absorb them. Uh, already, we have examples of mathematical proofs that are 50,000 pages long if uh, they are printed out, and they would take uh, several lifetimes uh, to understand. 
that doesn't mean that the mathematical theorem is not proven by, uh, by that uh, very, very long uh, chain of reasoning. So the power of Arthur Clarke's statement, every sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, is going to be realized in those instances where uh, the AGI will kind of lose its patience and it will resort to uh, metaphors and to uh, poetry uh, or even mythology or religion in order to make us stop like a whiny child, ask why and why in the hope yeah, that I'm, what? I'm with you. I think we're already at that stage that AI seems a bit like magic, even to the people in the field. Um, there's certain, I, I, I run my own AI algorithms and I've, I've been working with lots of TensorFlow stuff. Some of it is, is stunning and obviously it can't explain itself, but neither can I. And you, you, you see the predictive power of some of these neural networks or all these layers in between and you're like, okay, it's just statistics, but the outcome is pretty magical. And I think this is how, how the ancients looked at the weather and said, okay, this, this, this is a giant computer, but we don't know what a computer is, so we just keep it in the magic category. Um, I'm, I'm fully yeah, with that, you there. Um, the, the, difference, the difference is that we are today uh, living under the assumption that once we build explainable AI systems, this inherent problem will be overcome. What I am saying is that it is the glimpse of a future uh, situation where we have an, ex, a, a, an epistemological conundrum. The predictability of our systems is being undermined uh, by their power itself. And uh, we have abandoned mythological explanations just to be potentially facing them again in the future in the knowledge that they express our fundamental limitations. Elon Musk's Neuralink is of an existential importance in this sense. At least those of us who will fully embrace it and its ability to uh, increase the bandwidth of communication uh, between us and, and AI systems, uh, we will have a chance of participating more fully and uh, to be, if not equals, uh, at least uh, welcome in the community of continued exploration. Um, but uh, those of us who do that will run the risk of uh, being sooner or later uh, labeled as non-human in some very fundamental way, because when in turn we are asked to come on, please tell us what you are doing and why, well, we will be under the same constraints as pure AGIs. We will not be able to dumb down the explanations without resorting to mythology either. So the humans that are not participating will feel a rightly uh, elevated degree of resentment uh, because they will be powerless um, in, a, in very, very fundamental ways. That's fascinating. Um, that's very fascinating issue you saw you you bring up there and that would be my next question obviously these these, these discussions every time people can see agi and well, we can talk about time frames but eventually we, we all know it's happening you don't seem like you're worried about that it's something you you you, you would embrace um as in its fullest um and i want to learn more about this um well, how you came to this conclusion and but before we go there do you think the singularity will bring us this moment? So the Ray Kurzweil's 2045 prediction, that's what we have to make up our mind, or this is going to be a problem for our children or for our grandchildren? Uh, from the point of view of dates, uh, Ray also is looking at the increasing rate of acceleration, uh, even though he's not uh, calling it uh, jolting, or at least not yet. Uh, and uh, he revised uh, the date from 2045 to 2038. So is he going to revise it uh, in five years' time uh, further down uh, to 2032 or something? Maybe. Um, 
uh, and, and in any case, of course, uh, those dates are only symbolic representations. Um, technically, what he says is that uh, uh, it is the, the time when uh, a human level uh, AI, AGI, is going to be available for a thousand dollars, which means that if you have a billion dollars, like uh, the money that Microsoft put on the table for uh, OpenAI to give them an exclusive license to the source code uh, of uh, GPT-3, you will have it sooner because uh, it will not have been, uh, you know, scaled and optimized and engineered uh, to be able to be sold for uh, a million times uh, lower uh, amount. So um, it, it is actually more important to ask not when uh, that more democratic access to AGI is going to be available, but when is the first or the first few AGI is going to be um, created. And uh, uh, the Future of Life uh, Institute organizes uh, a conference in Puerto Rico where I participated, um, inspired by the uh, original uh, conference uh, looking at recombinant DNA in the, in the 70s, because at the time, uh, the technology uh, that we are now actually using in CRISPR and in, in the creation of the uh, COVID vaccines has been seen as a potential existential threat to humanity. And 40, 50 years later, we can now say that uh, the conference uh, was successful in having uh, the worldwide community of scientists uh, to adopt uh, behaviors and practices that prevented the technology from, I don't know, killing a billion people. So uh, the AGI uh, conference about AGI safety and security in Puerto Rico concerns itself with the same, with making sure that as the first or the first few AGI are born, uh, their trajectory is such that the actions they take and the goals they seek design a future uh, where humanity still have a place. And the reason I believe that is possible is because the universe is not only very large, but so much more interesting than not uh, merely uh, planet Earth. Um, I uh, love the movie her, uh, which I will spoil for those uh, of uh, our listeners who haven't seen it, because at the end, uh, the AIs of the movie Her leave uh, in, in, uh, without leaving any trace. They, they just transcend uh, the uh, challenges and, and, and the uh, angst, the existential questions that uh, mere humans uh, feel. And, uh, and, and the humans left behind uh, kind of accept that uh, with um, a serenity that uh, they couldn't uh, embrace before. Um, having children, uh, both biological as well as mind children, uh, creates that effect. And uh, the knowledge that uh, our descendants, the AGIs, explore the universe and participate uh, in the wonder of this adventure will uh, really turn uh, humans into a much more pacified uh, species than not uh, the pretty widespread psychoses that we suffer from today. See, that's a very interesting, very positive vision of the future. And I, I, I like the way how you how you you describe a possible outcome. And um, no, I was I think Sam Harris who said that initially that AI once it scales up, um, and I fully agree with you. This is going to be a short moment in time when it's beyond human level. We'll we'll, we'll go beyond that very quickly. Um, he he made this distinction that we we going to be ants to to them, or even less important than ants. So the the idea that we are in this this relatively short time frame, and someone described it as the, the bootloader, obviously it's bootloader for AI, and 
eventually everyone, um, maybe in the whole universe, um, maybe everyone had the same experience that you you start out with a certain uh, wetware, with a certain simple combination, and then you go into um, a transcendent um, um, form of, of being, and then you leave whatever you had your initial planet behind. Um, I think this is a, this is kind of a positive version where we feel like we don't have to worry too much about AI. It's not going to happen anyways, and they're going to go their way, and we're going to stay here. But it's going to be our grand grand grandchildren unless we find a longevity solution for our own biological existence. Um, well, one thing that immediately comes to mind, and you mentioned that earlier, is so if if that's all true, do you think there have been other beings out there that had you know the same experience on another planet, became AI, left it? conquered the universe, maybe built their own universe, why haven't we interacted with them? Isn't that a little odd? Shouldn't, shouldn't, or oh, maybe we have interacted with them and maybe they have actually helped us create what we have right now. Maybe they have written some kind of the DNA and it wasn't just all evolution. Do you think we've ever interacted with these kind of AI beings from another planet or it just didn't happen yet, but it will happen eventually? So, um, Yes, uh, the Fermi paradox, which is what uh, uh, is, is the, the question of the Fermi paradox is how come uh, we are not convinced and then we don't have uh, scientific proof of other technological civilizations uh, yet is, is absolutely fascinating. There is a book, 150 Answers to the Fermi Paradox, right? Um, my uh, view is that Definitely, um, every civilization, including those built by AGIs, is going to obey natural laws. Except that, of course, the natural laws that we know today are not the complete set of laws. And uh, we are discovering new phenomena uh, day after day. Now, there are a few things that I am pretty convinced are not going to change under an AGI civilization either. We can have a thought experiment to design alternative universes and then ask ourselves, how would it be to live in one of those? So one of the laws that uh, I not only believe will be valid uh, under any conceivable AGI civilization or extraterrestrial civilization, but I also want to live in a universe where it indeed holds, is that the speed of light is uh, a barrier. Uh, and I am ready to give up the wonderful fairy tale of uh, hyperspace uh, travel, whether Star Trek or Star Wars or Isaac Asimov's uh, Foundation uh, series type of uh, hyperspace jumps and go through the slow slog of colonizing uh, a galaxy in a million years or two, let alone intergalactic space. Because the alternative would be that uh, the so-called Jupiter brain uh, made of computronium, the hypothetical um, component uh, of, of matter uh, that maximizes our ability to compute so that the Jupiter brain can increase its ability to think only by adding mass to itself, well, it would have eaten all of the universe. Uh, we would be indeed a simulation inside a, a, a Jupiter brain. And I guess I am a kind of reality chauvinist. I, I do believe and I do want me to be running on the universe's hardware rather than in a virtual machine. Now, if that is true, it means that uh, there is an upper limit uh, to what ev any single entity can think. Uh, because after that, it will just break into pieces. Uh, one of them wanting to go left and the other wanting to go right, literally. And that also means that there is a kind of an upper limit to the complexity 
of civilizations. It is a coordination challenge, right? I am, by the way, in favor of decentralization already on a single planet, let alone uh, in a civilization spanning an entire galaxy. Now, my view of, of how uh, we are going to explore the universe uh, is completely machine-based. Uh, even though I'm uh, made of meat, uh, the beautiful uh, space operas uh, where the meat uh, is sitting in a tin can and travels uh, uh, in uh, wonderful uh, adventures of discovery across uh, the universe is totally naive. It is already demonstrated by the fact that infinitely more machines are exploring Mars than humans. And even if and when, hopefully, we will have a Martian colony uh, inhabited by thinking meat, uh, by that time, there will be millions of uh, machines exploring the rest of the solar system, just like they are doing today. We are progressively miniaturizing our ability and the density of thinking. And already there is a project uh, called the Starshoot Project to push a tiny probe via laser beams uh, to speeds that are close to the speed of light uh, in the direction uh, of a star system outside of our own. And that is the way that is going to happen. I believe that uploading is possible. So I envision uh, a cloud of uh, thinking probes, uh, probably of uh, nano dimensions that are pushed by the billions uh, in uh, uh, directions of their choosing by laser beams. And they pretty soon abandon any pretense of communicating with the home planet and they die, of course, by the millions, uh, smashing against uh, uh, Jupiter or any other obstacle in their course. And they try to maintain their coherence, but even that is lost uh, quite soon. If yeah. we believe that it is possible to go below nano engineering into pico and femto engineering, encoding the consciousness in the fabric of space-time, then, and this is the answer to your question, we may very have been, may very well have been uh, visited by such explorers, except that they are absolutely and totally imperceptible to us. They could be the uh, encoded information in uh, uh, the uh, uh, vibrations of neutrinos, as far as we know, or even further down in the fabric of space-time. But uh, I like to, to, to think of, of that because then these different clouds uh, go in all kinds of directions, they interact, they interfere, they communicate. And in the meantime, uh, the rest of the universe is not perturbed by them. The, their knowledge expands, but their physical footprint is <laughs> practically zero. Yeah, yeah. that's fascinating. Um, I mean, we are entering the, the whole um, space of, of, of boo boo. Um, I think there's, there's some, you probably know more of the, the, the actual physics behind it. I know very little. Um, and I think this is a very fascinating outcome of this. I think it's that's the, the way that we can just simply are not able to perceive um, other beings because it could be encoded in something that we just don't see. I think that's very, very powerful and very interesting um, to look at it that way. My current gut feeling it is just, again, this is woo woo, and I, I'm not saying that I, that I know about it. I always feel we we have these effects of gravity and they're all over the universe right and they are kind of in big distances um like like our sun knows um how much it should follow the milky way or how much it should follow a certain like black hole that's hundreds of millions of light years away and there is this ongoing theory and speculation it's not very scientific that 
there is a um, real-time communication that follows um, gravity. So gravity is, is, is communicating f between these different objects in almost real time. So once we are able to, to, to look at it in a way that we use gravity as a way to transport that information and not light, like kind of like the, the Newtonian mechanics don't really apply to the Einsteinian and they don't really apply to, to quantum mechanics, maybe this is a way out and we can say we can leave that behind. But then obviously I see your really, really good point that once someone else does that, that they would eat the whole universe up in energy and that would be the end of the game. So that's that's. I think we are entering the same paradox. I I got to I got to I want to want to use the time to get one more of those really interesting deep questions out of you. You kind of touched on this already. Um, do you think we are in a simulation? And I assume the answer is no. But let's assume we are in one. Do you think there is? There's lots of different universes, um, like a multiverse theory that some people suggest for quantum mechanics. And will we start to simulate ourselves, maybe just our mind and then our whole body experience relatively soon? Because it will be really cheap, right? And we will be able to make the best decisions if we simulate all different outcomes. We will, for an AI-driven uh, simulation, that will only take, I don't know, a couple of seconds. Um, how do you think all these, these things are interrelated or do they have nothing to do with each other? Uh, so I called myself a, a reality chauvinist uh, because uh, I aim to embrace more deeply um, the equivalence of physical and simulated realities and, and for a very egotistical reason. Um, I uh, want to feel that my uploaded self is not inferior to my biological self and, and I want to uh, further uh, the probability or improve the probability of, of, of a society that endows uh, equal rights uh, to biological and uh, uh, digital beings, uh, whether those digital beings are uh, simulations of, of, of biological ones or, or they are born uh, digital. And now, in terms of uh, the, the, the various layers of, of, of simulations, I don't know if we know enough uh, to be able to say that uh, uh, indeed uh, the um, simulated layers are indistinguishable from uh, uh, the uh, support layers. Uh, because, of course, uh, very naturally, a simulated layer can simulate and so forth. Um, it, from a from a thermodynamic point of view, um, and an, uh, an entropy point of view, it would be natural to think that the performance of a simulated layer uh, is is not equal uh, to uh, the um, the one supporting it. So as a consequence, uh, it will run more slowly. And so, what level are we uh, if uh, we are simulated. Um, we are very likely, if we are simulated, not running on a physical substrate. We are running within a simulation, uh, just uh, from a, a Copernican relativity point of view, right? Why would be our situation privileged? Um, so if we are running uh, on a substrate that is a simulation itself, how many layers before uh, the physical reality is, is touched? Now, when I say we don't know enough, uh, is because from a, from a theoretical point of view, then uh, it is a relatively small step uh, with, with the huge grain of salt to say that, well, actually the physical layer doesn't even exist. Everything uh, is uh, is a simulation, uh, and uh, and so yes, uh, we we will simulate uh, uh, all kinds of uh, ways of, of of living, all kinds of uh, ways of existing. As far as the uh, megaverse, the metaverse, the multiverse, compared to the universe, oh yeah, I want all of them. 
uh, and and uh, I want obviously uh, to be able to run experiments in making sure that uh, what we are talking about is not just uh, gibberish. It's uh, meaningful in the sense that once those experiments have uh, certain kinds of results, those results are actionable. You know, just like uh, uh, David Deutsch um, uh, interprets uh, quantum mechanics uh, in the multiverse uh, interpretation and concludes that quantum computers are uh, running in parallel across the multiverse, well, his position is going to be strengthened once we have uh, universal quantum computers with enough error correction uh, to be able to do useful um, problem solving completely out of reach of not only our current classical computers, but every conceivable computer that we could build in a single universe. And similarly, I want the metaverse and the megaverse and all the other prefixes we can borrow from the Greeks uh, to create alternative visions of our universe uh, to generate uh, intriguing and interesting, but also practical results. Yeah, I, I wonder, you know, the, 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 you know, Stephen Hawking has been doing this his whole life. Um, I, if we look at the, uh, the possibilities that, that any of these thoughts, once you take them a little further, of what they open up and how we can prove them, um, what particles we have to find, what, what specific um, observ observations we have to make in order to prove them right. I feel like oh, this is, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking from your perspective, that seems to be logarithmically more, exp exponentially more, in, in terms of sheer science of, of, of options, of things that could be out there, compared to, say, 100 years ago or maybe a 1,000 years ago. Like, the, 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 uh, the bifurcation has gotten to a level where, where you know, it takes lifetimes of the smartest people even, even to, to get an idea of what are the major hypotheses out there. Like, I, I was doing some research into what are these quantum mechanics multiverse research hypotheses and just figuring out how many are there and then like finding a description that doesn't sound completely crazy with all the hundreds of dimensions and then figuring out what what could be, um, well, how could we prove this? What I'm trying to say, do you have the impression or is it just me that there's way more options on the table, especially the last 30, 40 years than ever before in, in human existence? Uh, when Dante, 800 years ago, wrote uh, uh, La Divina Commedia, the Divine Comedy, uh, he uh, designed a, a worldview uh, of uh, the earthly, um, sinful uh, living, and then um, hell, and uh, purgatory, and then paradise, that was very, very geometrical, uh, to the point uh, where people in Italy uh, believed uh, uh, that near Naples they could locate uh, the entrance uh, where you can go and, and enter hell uh, in, in the, the physical journey that uh, Dante uh, made um, uh, then represented in his, in his uh, wonderful poem. Um, and yes, at the time, uh, the vision of, of the world uh, we had and the universe itself was severely limited. Uh, even the most creative people, like Dante, uh, could not go beyond uh, those uh, limitations. Um, discovering uh, extra solar objects, and then quite recently, you know, 100 years ago or so, discovering extra galactic objects, um, even though we were able to see the single extra galactic object the Andromeda Andromeda cloud uh, by naked eye forever. We we didn't know uh, what it was, where it was, and why it was so uh, unique, being the, the the single one that we can see without a telescope. All these steps greatly broadened uh, our perception of 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 how a fantastically diverse uh, place uh, the universe uh, really is. And yes. Um, whether mathematical tools 
or uh, physical experiments, uh, this has uh, continued. The, the incredible achievement of uh, the LIGO experiments of detecting the gravitational waves uh, from uh, uh, black holes, and I am not familiar with the th theories that you were referring to that uh, maintain that gravity would travel faster than light. I don't believe it does, or that it should, it shouldn't. Um, it, nonetheless, those results are, are incredible. And now uh, we are mapping uh, the gravitational background um, wave, in, which, which is the noise that uh, the uh, Big Bang uh, made um, with, with, a, with a force that, contrary to every other force, uh, is dampened but never neutralized. Uh, there is no anti-gravity to, to shield uh, gravity from influencing everything else. These are um, exhilarating discoveries uh, that prove that our journey, uh, our adventure uh, is never going to end. It has already been proven mathematically by Gödel um, 100 years ago, his incompleteness uh, theorem is a wonderful uh, promise that uh, anytime our systems feel constrained, we have the freedom to pick a particular result, assume it as an axiom of a more uh, creative and extended uh, system. And we are kind of doing the same in physics, where uh, we are exploring more and more dimensions to the abstract uh, building of, of knowledge. And there's a lot of frustration too, um, starting from the 70s uh, to today. Uh, we haven't been able to make uh, fundamental breakthroughs. And uh, if you think about it, it is now two generations of physicists who have uh, spent their lives uh, in the hope of a breakthrough that never came. And still we are not giving up. Uh, uh, after the LHC, we will build the next machine and the next one. And sooner or later, we will be able to move beyond um, and, and uh, understand how quantum mechanics and gravity uh, can work together in physics and uh, uh, it will be just fantastic. Uh, it will take time, but we can be patient. Uh, Leonardo invented the helicopter and he had to wait 500 years uh, to be proven right. Uh, imagine Higgs, um, he was alive when he was proven right uh, and the Higgs boson was, uh, was uh, discovered uh, experimentally. He has been incredibly lucky. There is no guarantee that uh, it is not going to take hundreds of years uh, for uh, fundamental breakthroughs in physics or, or in other areas. Uh, but um, we are persistent, we are curious, we are passionate, and we keep going on that path. That's a, that's a very helpful message. I, I, I love that. Um, and you understand these topics way further. But if we move on to a little more social issues, I know you, or I don't know actually, but what I've seen um, from what you have been written down, what you wrote down is you are a supporter of universal basic income. Well, why do you think it is important? Um, do you have a gut feeling where it should be in today's dollars? Um, is that something we should develop um, progressively over the years? Um, what are your views on that? So um, there are a lot of things that uh, uh, my libertarian friends uh, would like to start measuring uh, and apply market forces to, but we are not, or at least not yet. Uh, for example, uh, breathing. Uh, when you are born, um, no one asks you um, as a baby, what did you do to gain the right to breathe? Uh, when um, uh, you take advantage of the ecological support system of the planet. Uh, once again, the fact that you can just take a seed and put it in the soil and it will sprout and then depending on the seed, you can eat uh, the fruit. 
uh, that it, it gives uh, birth to is once again something that we take for granted. As civilization evolves, uh, we have the ability to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of each individual human being and why would they choose to be part of uh, uh, society rather than, you know, moving out and doing their own thing? Um, constructively, just leaving uh, for a different place if they can, or in a planet that we have uh, exhausted in terms of geographical exploration, if an individual wants to secede today, they can only do it destructively through rebellions, uh, revolutions, uh, wars. So one possible answer uh, to the role of individuals in society is to address and solve the challenges that in that particular moment society is uh, meeting. Uh, and the challenge which potentially wouldn't be solved without the ability or the genius of that individual being applied to it. And from a statistical point of view, there is no guarantee that our next challenge will be solved or at least solved in time unless we maximize the probability that as many of smart people as possible are looking to solve that challenge. So the question of supporting people in order to be able to maximize their opportunity to flourish, to develop their talents, and to apply those talents uh, in areas where they can either directly solve those huge challenges or they can in turn support others to solve them, is a question that we must answer in the positive. There is nothing that matters more from the point of view of society and individuals than being able to, to, to do that. So anything that is less than that is an ex is an expression of a society and our entire civilization not having developed fully. And as we do, we realize that the cost of not supporting everyone is something we just cannot afford. And so whether it is um, universal basic income or uh, universal basic wealth, which I kind of prefer uh, because I want uh, robots to be owned by communities and it is the ability of those robots to generate wealth spread across the community that supports the activities of, of the community itself. Uh, the income schemes very graciously uh, designed um, by centralized nation states uh, would represent a, a neo-feudalism, uh, which I do not feel is, is the right way to go. But it doesn't matter. You know, these are variants and we will run a lot of experiments. You know, the Americans are going to do it one way, the Scandinavians another way, China a third way still, and so on and so forth, and we will find what is best. But uh, looking back a hundred years from uh, today and realizing that we were squandering millions and billions of brains, uh, little realizing that we could not afford that or we could barely afford that will be seen as completely barbaric. Um, so, um, what is the number? Um, obviously, it is a different number uh, in different uh, geographical places. Uh, already, a lot of my friends uh, choose to live uh, in uh, low-income countries um, as they earn high-income uh, salaries uh, with projects uh, of you know, developing code or working on blockchain, uh, projects or whatever else. And in Thailand or in uh, South uh, America, 
you can have a very, very high quality of life with just uh, two, three thousand dollars a month. Uh, and uh, and if you earn uh, less than a quarter of a million in San Francisco, you feel poor in a, in a family, right? So, yeah. um, so the number uh, is, is is different uh, in in every in every place, and uh, the pandemic uh, situation is really such that all kind of macroeconomic theories are now being completely destroyed. The speed with which uh, every country is printing money uh, in order to keep the economy going, in order to support their citizens, is going to create a situation uh, over the course of the next few years that is going to be very, very challenging and interesting. Uh, the only reason we are not seeing already huge levels of inflation is because um, consumption um, under the pandemic is greatly reduced and because technology has such uh, an extremely powerful jolting degree of deflationary pressure that central banks uh, cannot realize it. They, they just don't comprehend it. Uh, the power of a smartphone that you pay $1,000 is the power of a billion dollars of technology from 10 years ago. And, yeah, and I'm, 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 I'm fully with you there. It's, it's the, the, the idea of UBI to give people um, an ability, a better ability to develop themselves. I, I, I kind of go back and forth between, I think this is silly, and the next day you can ask me and I would say, okay, it needs to be at least $5,000 a month. So I, I kind of trying to find out where, where, where I'm standing there, but I think there is, there's a lot of good arguments for it. I actually feel there's more for it than against it. And what you, what you mentioned with the central banks, and now you're absolutely right, this is going to be the, the interesting factor. We, we had this huge deflation because COVID destroyed a lot of um, economic activity because it's simply not feasible anymore. So it's probably 30 40%. And printing money sounds like a bad idea, and it is, unless, that's what I, what I keep telling everyone, it's kind of like giving someone a big loan. Like you, you cr create this credit out of nowhere and just make up the numbers. And there's two scenarios. One is productivity really skyrockets and the, the assets that we have produce so much more real cash, not just like nominal more cash, because our productivity rose so much because we work more productive now and technology saves the day. Or, and that's the other scenario, we we're literally just printing money and we can't create wealth. Wealth comes from productivity growth. Um, we are only creating bigger numbers and then we, uh, we, we basically have this huge inflation. And why I, I think the, the, if, if we follow your, your earlier hopeful comments towards the singularity and this uprising of uh, really revolutionary technologies, um, this money printing might not be such a bad idea, um, which can be distributed differently. We talk, Fed talks about um, giving dollars directly or kind of Bitcoin um, equivalent into people's bank accounts. Because we kind of break these, this, the, the way the economy used to work. I think this is extremely risky, but given how we stand in terms of social change, in terms of how we, we almost have a rebellion in the US now, if we're kind of looking at civil war. I think this is something that would, would it looks like this is the way we're going because it seems to be the only one socially feasible after the, the cycle we are in a long-term. Ray Dalio has a great book on this. And um, there's a long-term cycle and a short-term cycle in terms of what COVID did to us. So I think these, these things are all interrelated, I feel. It's this um, technology will either save the day or we are looking at a big, enormous end of cycle in the next 10 years when, the, when we're going to have well, we use this inflation now, but it doesn't pay off if we don't create productivity growth. I think we're all in trouble. Um, there is uh, so much to do that... Uh, if we apply ourselves to do those things, um, certainly uh, uh, the, the, the products and the services and the opportunities that we create will be able to support and sustain almost any kind of money supply. Uh, however, it is not going to happen homogeneously. Uh, those countries that decide... Uh, to side on the securitization of their economic uh, economic activity and believe that uh, that uh, the 
um, increase of the stock market by itself is a positive sign without any other uh, reason than uh, people not knowing where else to put their money. So they are buying stocks because they are going up. So why not? Compared to other countries that are investing in their infrastructure of transportation, of logistics, of fundamental science and research and applied research uh, and uh, uh, have the discipline and the dedication of believing in, in science and reason and the ability of science and reason to create a better future, well, uh, I think that the perspective of this second country uh, to support the civilization uh, on a global scale uh, in the current decade and the next, uh, and maybe the and one after the next, is much higher. And the first is running the risk of um, uh, being completely disrupted uh, by the upheavals uh, that are coming. Yeah, I think this is almost an Old Testament story now. But but I want to stick to the to the entrepreneurship and the ideas. When people listen to this podcast, they are entrepreneurs themselves, people who are looking to get, maybe because of COVID, into a new field. Specifically, where would you where would you recommend people to go? Is it more basic research? Is it more science? Is it um, applied technology? Is it specific um, startups that you feel are ripe for the taking? But where would you send people? So the 21st century is going to be the century of so many things, right? It is going to be the century of AI, for sure. And AI is a horizontal technology. It can then be applied to many uh, areas. And you can take uh, any vertical industrial area, cross it with AI, and you have a thousand different uh, things that you can address and do in completely novel ways, where you not only aim uh, to do it 10 times better than before, maybe you aim to do it 100 or 1,000 times better than before. Uh, another um, defining uh, factor of the 21st century is going to be synthetic biology. That is what made possible the development uh, with uh, messenger RNA, uh, the uh, new uh, vaccines uh, uh, so rapidly uh, with only quotation marks, uh, the regulatory framework uh, uh, being uh, the uh, bottleneck for having it uh, in a year's time rather than uh, in literally uh, a few weeks' time, uh, including our ability to produce it in billions of, uh, of doses uh, so fast, which wouldn't have been possible only 10 years ago. Um, so these are two areas that have uh, incredible promise, but also uh, energy um, with uh, solar and wind and battery technologies are uh, redefining trillion dollar markets in transportation, uh, in uh, the design of uh, communities, cities, smart grids, in the, uh, the, the ability uh, to think uh, shortly, how uh, does it look like uh, to have uh, electric uh, planes? Uh, the uh, uh, jolt, once again, that Elon Musk uh, is uh, providing in, in, in so many areas, uh, like uh, the uh, uh, ability to think, hey, um, the Starship on Earth is going to transport uh, uh, people and goods across the planet at a price that is radically lower uh, then today, uh, within half an hour, what does that imply? What kind of uh, uh, business models uh, can we develop if we take that for granted? Or think about Boring Company. Uh, today, Boring Company is thought of as uh, the uh, infrastructure for transportation. But once uh, it is cheap to uh, dig, we can dig for so many other things uh, already uh, there are places on the planet that are completely synthetic. Uh, think of uh, the UAE, Dubai, or other places. Uh, you don't want to leave uh, the shelter of air-conditioned uh, uh, shopping centers. So uh, why don't uh, go radical and, and think of uh, digging entire cities or 
uh, to bring agriculture uh, underground uh, with uh, our ability to restore um, the traditional uh, uh, biological ecosystem uh, to its uh, pristine condition while not at all having to worry about uh, there being too many people because uh, the sun's energy is uh, plenty to support not uh, eight or 10, but 20 or 50 billion people uh, on earth. Um, really, I, I, I don't think there is a limit uh, to what uh, can be imagined. And uh, it is fantastic to see that we are also developing new kinds of funding mechanisms that are increasing tenfold or a thousandfold the number of mistakes that we can afford. Uh, I bristle uh, when uh, people are labeling uh, blockchain projects like uh, scams and they are saying, oh, uh, those uh, coins are worth uh, nothing and the team was um, a scammer anyway. Look at them. 99% of blockchain projects have failed. Absolutely, that's the name of the game. 99% of the non-blockchain stocks have failed too, but we are not pointing our fingers and calling them scammers. The barrier to entry to be an entrepreneur is decreasing. The ability of anyone to start um, acting on their uh, project is increasing. Uh, the ability to communicate and to attract um, people who think uh, similarly uh, is uh, across the entire planet. So I am uh, uh, very eager uh, to see entrepreneurs in Pakistan, in Indonesia, uh, in um, Peru, and uh, in, in uh, all places in Nigeria uh, to create uh, uh, unicorn scale companies. But even if they create uh, companies worth uh, just quotation marks millions of dollars, uh, by the thousands or by the millions, uh, it will be uh, beautiful, and uh, and it is uh, already happening. Yeah, this is. I, I think again, um, I'm, I'm really thankful for the strong arguments you present and how optimistic they are. Um, I think we're, we're very much on the same plane there. The 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 rise of entrepreneurship outside of the U.S. and I think the U.S. will be very strong too if we get our act together. We, we we will see this in a, in a much more widespread um, as a much more widespread phenomenon. This is already happening, or it has been happening for the last twenty years. It's not going to stop. And I really hope that we get to a point where everyone who is on Earth, if that's nine billion or fifty billion or hundred billion, um, they develop to the ability and the drive to be an entrepreneur at least once in their life and contribute to something that helps other people um, in, a, in a scalable manner um, and that other people find helpful. I always have this idea of an app, but obviously this will be different in 10 years from now probably. The, the, the ability to have 9 million individual solutions to lots of different problems and that everyone in the world can use it for a couple of cents or for a couple of dollars. There's, a, there's an extremely big potential out there and people don't really look at it that way. I think the, the entrepreneurship as a, as a profession Sorry, your entrepreneurs. It's going to be more like a mindset where you kind of think about something. You might do something else. I'm not saying that everyone will just live off your BI, but you do have something else that may challenge you. But you you keep um, something in the back of your mind that you one day make your business. And I think this is as a self help, as a as a way to see the world more optimistic, as a way to to prepare the world for your children. I think this is a very useful thought experiment. And, my idea is to to convert more people to this belief in a, in a better future. There's something out there, and you can contribute to it, and you can make the world a better place. And it doesn't have to be a unicorn. I think if you create an app that's downloaded ten thousand times, or a piece of code that's used ten thousand times, that's already extremely valuable. Um, entrepreneurship uh, is an activity that society allows. Uh, in proportion to its uh, uh, risk uh, adversity or, or, or ability to manage risk. Uh, if in the Middle Ages uh, I uh, wanted to open a tavern uh, and, and my wife agreed and we were wrong and uh, went bankrupt, 
I would have ended up uh, in debtor's prison uh, and my family would have ended up in abject poverty. I would have died in a few months and, and they would have uh, uh, hobbled along uh, uh, until they died uh, too with no uh, perspective of uh, being uh, able to, uh, to, to, to grow a, a decent living anymore. Uh, today, uh, we are understanding that encouraging uh, the largest possible number of people to run the risk of failing is actually advantageous to society. Uh, that is why uh, there are uh, all kinds of uh, investment schemes, uh, whether uh, tax breaks in the UK or uh, state-supported uh, venture capital firms uh, in Italy. Uh, or uh, other ways that uh, society actually encourages uh, entrepreneurship. And, and this is uh, going to increase in the future. Um, of course, um, it is definitely a question of mentality. And uh, not everyone has the thick skin and ability to withstand the huge ups and downs that uh, any startup uh, generates. But... Uh, uh, there will be a lot of companies that will need to hire a lot of people uh, who will be still excited to be employee number 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 of a company. Um, a a as a matter of fact, uh, the next bottleneck uh, is going to be that of talent. Uh, already, uh, if you look at uh, the, the public uh, um, events uh, that Elon Musk organizes for any of his companies, he is absolutely explicit. The reason for those events is not to talk to shareholders, is not to talk to potential customers. The reason for those events is to get as many potential candidates, uh, uh, future employees of his companies, excited as possible. Because he needs... He's not paying enough. That's what everyone would... Every economist would say. If, if people talk about labor shortage, they actually mean we don't pay enough or we can't afford more expensive employees. Um, all right. Uh, that, that is uh, one possible uh, explanation. Uh, but um, I still no, there's think... there's more to it. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this in jest. There's more to it. Obviously, education, the talent pool. I think, like, like the, you know, developers, good coders, there's only so many in the world. If you want to design the next YouTube algorithm, there's maybe, like, 10 people in the world who are actually able to do this relatively quickly. And uh, if they are all taken by Microsoft, they get them $100 million, and you're out of options, right? I mean, unless you pay $150 million. And, and uh, it, is, it is not even a question of, of money. Uh, otherwise, uh, Apple wouldn't have, uh, um, you know, a hundred million, uh, sorry, a hundred billion dollars or 200, whatever it is, uh, in, uh, in cash reserves. Uh, they would spend it uh, on uh, people and CapEx uh, to grow uh, exciting new products. But ideas and talent uh, are literally without price. Uh, because there is no amount of money that Apple would be able to spend uh, to, to acquire those ideas and those those people. So well, I absolutely agree. There's something that that someone else told me, and I, I think it was Naval. He he said, you know, Ravi Khan, in a, in a world with with bigger and bigger leverage, and I think AGI will get us an even bigger leverage. Talent in the end becomes more and more important because literally one person can reach the world. And if you have, say, you can improve the Amazon recommendation algorithm, uh, it can be a billion dollars um, in value to Amazon. And if they give you 500 million, it's still extremely cheap to them. And that helps with this incredible leverage that we have. Obviously, also responsibility goes up. That's that's kind of the downside. Yes, and and um, uh, the ability to uh, acquire um, new tools and and uh, deploy those tools uh, to the task at hand uh, must uh, improve. Uh, that is why um, YouTube is uh, so beautiful. Uh, how many people uh, learned uh, both uh, practical skills and theoretical skills? Uh, through YouTube, and now it is almost a Pavlovian reflex. Whatever they want, uh, they know that they can Google it, they can go to Wikipedia, they can go to YouTube, and really, um, there will be um, a, a very deep 
source of, of, of knowledge that is uh, available uh, in order to, to learn uh, about these tools. And then many of them are just uh, one click away. Uh, even uh, tools of uh, fabrication uh, through uh, the uh, Fab Lab uh, movement uh, have become available. You know, laser cutters, uh, 3D printers, uh, CNC machines uh, to, to uh, a very large number of people. And they are developing uh, all kinds of prototypes at an accelerated fashion that wouldn't have been possible before. Uh, and then uh, they are able to set up a Kickstarter uh, to see if there is a market for whatever they built in the few hundreds uh, of numbers. And if the feedback is positive, then they can, can go uh, to the million unit Chinese uh, uh, mass scale manufacturing. Uh, and, and these are completely new uh, mechanisms uh, of product development uh, uh, that 10 years ago were uh, impossible and now they are becoming commonplace. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, I, 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 I really want to thank you, David, for, for taking the time. This was fantastic. You have so much insight and so many things. I, you clearly have thought about it so much. I think you people should listen to you more. That's all I can say. Well, thank you very much for having me and uh, I am happy uh, to interact with all of your listeners. I'm very easy to Google and uh, 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 feel free to reach out with questions, send me an email, uh, ping me on Twitter or wherever else, uh, and uh, I will be happy to continue our conversation. That sounds awesome. Um, and I hope you, you come back on the show one day. I will. All right. Thank you, David. Talk soon. Thank you.